Good morning. I just do need to say that I'm an assistant professor at Gordon College in the sociology social work department and teach in the peace and conflict studies minor. I'm going to be speaking this morning about talking about guns and the need for dialogue about guns as a forerunner for transpartisan work around this issue. But I have to admit, I've never shot a gun. I've never even held one. I lived in northern Minnesota for almost 30 years, and almost everyone there had guns for hunting. And I have to admit, I admired the intergenerational camaraderie that people had when they went to their cabins to hunt deer every fall. I never thought about guns, and I never saw them as a risk to myself personally, my family, or my community. But over the past 20 years, I have to admit, I've become kind of a gun hater. This is problematic for me because I am a professor that teaches peace and conflict studies, and as a person of faith, I'm committed to a life of love and not hate. But then there's been too many shootings, too many deaths, too many victims, too many communities who have to suffer these losses. We've had too many shootings of everyday citizens in malls, theaters, and churches. Starting with Columbine, continual shootings here in Boston, on neighborhood streets, Virginia Tech, and of course the horrendous and tragic scene in Newtown. We've had shootings like Congressman Giffords, whose lives were saved, but capabilities and talents were severely compromised. And this past week, we have witnessed the horrific racially motivated killings of senior citizens, pastors, and another political leader in Charlestown. This week, I have had to contain my hatred toward guns and toward this young man, the alleged shooter in Charleston. When we think back, there's been so many of these shootings of young men with a similar profile, young, white, unable to establish themselves financially, find their social location, angry at others who have. They have typically been motivated by campaigns based on in insecurity, fear, and hatred, whether they are towards women, blacks, or the government. My rage about these deaths, their killers, and their capacity to acquire guns became the focus of my research. I had little interest in the guns themselves, but rather how people acquired these guns. For what reasons? And what were the motives behind their reasons? I read both pro and anti-gun gun literature. I became informed about the NRA lobby, the gun show loophole for quick sales, and the gun industry itself. At this point, I was beyond gun hating. I was beginning to hate gun owners, gun sellers, and gun producers. In spite of all the community outrage, gun laws have loosened, not tightened in recent years. You can now carry a gun in a national park or into a Walmart. In some states, you can carry openly non-concealed weapons. So I started looking at public policy and discovered almost every effort at gun control has failed, as we all know. Why? I intuitively knew gun control was part of the problem, the term itself, but did not see the entire scope of the issue, the meaning of guns in our current political divide and economic struggles. In my anger, I even started giving all of my end-of-the-year contributions to anti-gun organizations. I wanted to make sure that my position on gun control was the only one that advanced. When Obama was elected president, gun sales skyrocketed both times. This gave me pause. I started to ask deeper questions. What is it that people fear? Why do they feel a need to protect themselves? Who do they define as the enemy? It was clear the new gun agenda was not about hunting rights or having a revolver in my bedroom to protect my family. It was something far more complicated and woven into the many levels of individual and collective fear. In order to understand people that fought against gun control laws, I realized I needed to speak with them. But seeing news clips of angry men fighting for their constitutional rights to own a gun only magnified my anger and, I did, and did nothing to enhance my understanding of their fears or my fear of them. I began to see gun policy as the foremost polarizing issue in the United States that most politicians would not begin to address for fear of the NRA lobby and mixed constituent highly charged views. Perhaps most tragic was there were no public spaces to discuss this very difficult issue. 
There was no part transpartisan approach to the issue that was literally killing our children and continuing to threaten the safety of our communities. In 2010, I gave an address at a national conference that outlined the need for dialogue between pro and anti-gun activists. I laid out a compelling theories about the problem and the need for structures that would provide such a dialogue. I drew on David Hemingway's research at the Harvard School of Public Health who advocates reframing the issue away from gun control to an issue of community safety. I advocated this approach that does not ban guns, but rather create policies that will create, prevent violence and injuries. In his book, Private Guns, Public Health, he frames a public dialogue that must take place to agree on levels of gun access and use that promote community safety. At the end of the presentation, I was asked if I had actually led or participated in any of these dialogues I was proposing. I had to say no. I left with my academic tail between my legs and committed to finding another way. Last year, after learning that the Public Conversations Project had held a dialogue in Boston that brought diverse viewpoints together around guns, I approached Senior Vice President Bob Staines to see if I could contribute to their efforts. I was familiar with the Public conversation dialogue model and believed it could be the right format for the general public that was still highly polarized on the gun issue. I was interested in facilitating such dialogues, learning about best practices, and evaluating impact. Bob put me in touch with Minnesota, the Minnesota Council of Churches, who had used an adapted PCP model to hold community dialogues on two issues, same-sex marriage and gun policy. In interviews with both organizers and facilitators of the Minnesota Dialogues, I learned that across the state, citizens were far more engaged with the dialogue on same-sex marriage than gun dialogue. Most attributed this to the fact that there was, no, there was pending le legislation on the former and not the latter. Communities seemed to be more willing to discuss issues that had concrete public policy before them. The second conclusion was that same-sex marriage was more directly related to one's deepest values on both sides of the issue. Organizers did not see guns as having the same meaning, thus less motivation for public dialogue. But certainly, guns have meaning if your son or daughter has been killed on a college campus or a killer has entered and taken the lives of people in your church. Why is it that public safety issues do not translate to the general public on guns? What belief systems or fears contribute to the citizen that allows guns and access to them to be an ongoing threat to safety in the public square? In general, I contend that we have three spheres of influence on gun issue. The fear of guns and those who use them, the fear of those who could take away the right to own a gun, and the bystander. The bystander's fear is one that justifies looking the other way, refusing to see an issue as one that I will engage myself in. I've come to see the bystander sphere as the one that contributes most to our inability to engage solutions on the gun problem, both at the community level and public policy level. Until those of us who have not personally been affected by gun violence are willing to be outraged enough to care enough and create enough space for conversation in our communities to talk across our differences on gun policy, there will be little traction between the other opposing spheres. But what are the underlying values, meaning, and fears that create the two opposing spheres? Without going into all the third, uh, all the uh, amendment arguments that protect one's right to bear arms, it is important to identify a growing convergence of anti-government attitudes, particularly around the rights of citizens, the limits of federal government powers, and the rights of government powers. Recent breaches of rights by Homeland Security and surveillance of US citizens have only served to reinforce these fears. This fear is rooted in fear of a totalitarian government and the need to own guns to protect oneself. Some gun, own, some gun activists, like the shooter in Charleston, also extend this fear to the loss of white supremacy. The anti-gun activists, on the other hand, have core beliefs that the government's role is to protect the community by limiting gun access to individuals that have a criminal record, have a restraining order for domestic abuse, or have a record of mental illness. The sphere is rooted in the fear that allowing guns, particularly semi-automatic weapons in the hands of irrational 
and emotionally disturbed individuals are what make our communities unsafe, not government. When our communities are divided by what they fear most and what strategies really make us safe, we have to ask how can we begin, begin to understand these differences even before trying to reach common ground. Without this understanding of the opposing sphere and the engagement of the bystander, solutions will be limited and public policy gridlocked. In conflict resolution, differentiation or taking the time to hear and understand our differences is a crucial first step. This is not about persuading the other to take my position, but rather about deep listening to understand the underlying fears and hopes that support a perspective different from my own. Without this kind of dialogue, I would argue that a transpartisan approach is almost impossible. The Public Conversation Project and the Montana Mediation Association, the place known for its um, affirmation of guns, collaborated on a project in the fall of 2014 to implement a gun dialogue across difference in Butte, Montana, and I was invited to participate. The local partners had recruited 16 community leaders with diverse, very diverse opinions on gun policy that participated in the PCP dialogues Friday evening. All day Saturday, those community leaders were trained in the dialogue model, and Saturday evening they facilitated a dialogue for the general public. Participants were divided into small groups to reflect different perspectives on firearms. The evaluation completed by the participants right after the dialogue attempted to measure increased understanding of each other and empathy for the other's perspective, not persuasion of the other to the other point of view. In the post-dialogue survey, 39 out of 31 participants indicated that they felt their voices were heard. All participants agreed or strongly agreed that the conversation was respectful. In response to the statement, I have a better understanding of other points of view, 26 agreed or strongly agreed. Most participants, 28 out of 32, then answered either agreed or strongly agreed that their group demonstrated empathy toward each other, even though we disagreed. When asked what they learned from the dialogue, some of the comments were, I'm not as neutral as I thought. The issue was more complex than I thought. Perspectives are far more diverse than I expected. There were real reasons behind people's passion. Things and people are not as they seem. We are continuing to send out a follow-up survey to find out if people are continuing to using these techniques in encountering and dialoguing with the other. What we learned from the Minnesota Project was that not only did people continue to initiate dialogue across difference, but they also started to learn these skills in their personal life, in their work life, and in their greater community around other issues. The assumption is that basic skills, dialogue skills, if taught and practiced respectfully, can equip people not only with listening skills, but also with a new sense of inquiry and perhaps even compassion for each other. The goal is not agreement, it's mutual understanding. I believe is a prerequisite for transpartisan success in political chambers. Both have to occur, but without social movements that model a different way, the political process tends to remain entrenched in the status quo. How can we expect politicians to reach consensus across the aisle when we as citizens are unwilling to sit down face to face with a real person from the opposite sphere? How do we expect the public sector to solve the gun issue when we as individuals are still acting as bystanders. I want to make it clear that the dialogue process in and of itself will not enable us to reach a political consensus on gun policy. Dialogue alone will not solve the power imbalance between the NRA and gun policy activists, organizations, and their capacity to influence Congress. Dialogue will, however, shift our attitude about each other so we can be more effectively, more effectively find common ground so we can be more capable of crossing the aisle in order to create effective public policy. I realize there are some extremists in both spheres that will not even come to the table. And even if they do, they are so convinced of their position, they are unwilling to consider another way. 
But this again is why the third sphere is so important. Bystanders are usually at the side of the other, but not as interested in the extremists, thus choose not to be involved. This time has come for bystanders to come to the table and hold creative tension of moderates of, on either side. Our country can no longer be held hostage to extremists on both sides of the issue where no middle ground is possible. I admit after the shooting in Charlestown this past week, I was back to that gun hiding, hating place. I was hating the gun dealer that sold this trouble van, the gun, the gun factory in China that probably produced it, and the gun distributor that profited from this transaction. Even so, I was starting to hate the racist groups and their websites that fed this young man's fears with hatred. But when I saw a news story where the son of the one woman that was killed spoke about love, he said love would overcome hatred. If this young man, grieving the loss of his beautiful, vibrant mother of 45, could speak about love, I certainly could do the same. I have to say that I no longer hate gun owners and sellers. We have met face to face, and I have heard their stories. My hope is that the horrific tragedy in Charlestown will motivate the bystander sphere into dialogue that in time will effectively impact a transpartisan process for revised gun policy. It is only through dialogue that we will better understand the fears that drive us and the opportunities for addressing those fears. May we all be moved by the young man in Charleston that reminded us that love can still overcome hate even in the worst of circumstances. Thank you. <laughs>